Absolutely. <laughs> I have thought of that since, uh, since I got into the ISU. Uh, you see, um, speed skating, which I mean was the sport on which the International Skating Union was founded, because when it was founded it was only speed skating. But uh, it has always been completely subsidized by figure skating. Speed skating, uh, unfortunately, is not a sport uh, very popular all over the world. It is only in Holland where it is a national sport and it is not that appealing in television. So there are no many televisions paying money to broadcast uh, speed skating. And I must say, it has always been put as a compulsory clause into the figure skating contracts that the televisions were only also transmitting a few minutes of speed skating if they wanted to make a contract with the ISU. But uh, it is not only a question of money. It is a question that uh, since uh, when uh, Paulsen became the president, I mean, since when uh, Jacques Favard died, the ISU has been in the hands of speed skaters. And they decide almost everything. Because in the council, there is this uh, nonsense where all the matters are discussed by the, the two parts, let's say, of figure skating and speed skating together. Not, no matter if you are speaking of uh, speed skating records or special things in figure skating. I remember that I voted myself in the council for some speed skating records and I don't know if you run the 500 meters in 60 seconds or 60 hours. For me it is just the same. So, you know, you are involved in things in which you don't understand a thing. And with the fact that there are four council members for speed skating and four council members for figure skating with the same, let's say, weight in the council, and the president, who since uh, 25 years now is uh, a speed skater, you can easily understand that speed skating is running the ISU. And uh, it is running the ISU even in the elections, because uh, except for the technical committees which are elected separately, the council members are elected in a general session and therefore even there, you know, speed skating influences the, the elections in, in a very, very heavy way. And now we have seen that the, the speed skaters are even involved in very technical matters such as the new system. So, in my opinion, uh, it would be the only possible solution to split the ISU. There have been proposals which did not really foresee the splitting of the ISU, but at least uh, to have uh, separate meetings of the Council when dealing with the technical matters or special matters for each sport, and maybe have one meeting when you deal with general things such as signing of a contract or something like this. But this has been always very, very badly objected by Olaf Paulsen and now by Otavio Cinquanta, you can imagine, because they are afraid that this would be the first step towards the splitting. And uh, it will be very difficult to achieve that. It was tried with the World Skating Federation, but it was uh, finished before even starting. Because, of course, you see, um, speed skating cannot survive without figure skating. And since uh, the Constitution requires that you have a two-third majority in favor of any proposal, and since the speed skaters are more than the half of the members of the ISU, you will never get a two-third majority, you see. In my book I say it is like to ask the Turkish to vote for Thanksgiving. It is the same, the same situation. <laughs> 
So unless there is somebody from outside organizing a, a new figure skating federation, I don't see any possible way out. An improvement would already at least be that uh, at the next Congress, a president from figure skating is elected. This would be at least the first step. And you see, now that uh, the money is so reduced, and with the amount of money that the new system has involved, and still involves because it is awfully expensive to run every international competition and the ISU championships. Now perhaps the members, the figure skating members, when we will see that they give half of their money, which is now so little, to the speed skaters, maybe they will realize that it could be an idea to split the two sports. But I see it very difficult for the moment and very far away. Well, the principles were very, uh, very simple. I mean, to have a, a, a sport that works for the skaters, run by figure skating people only, by people who are supposed to know what they are talking about. Uh, the principles in the constitution on which I had worked were to have uh, tolerance zero for cheating and uh, crooks. They should be suspended for life, and this is a principle that even the ISU could follow. I mean, it's not necessary to be split. And uh, that was the main thing, to have a federation controlled and ran by figure skating people who worked only in the interest of the skaters and of the coaches who were supposed to be involved in the administration of the federation in, at all levels. I must say that it was absolutely expected that the ISU would have a very strong reaction uh, when uh, the World Skating Federation was announced. Uh, the thing is that the ISU threatened uh, to throw away all the skaters, all the judges, all the members who would simply express an opinion in favor of the World Skating Federation, not to speak of becoming members. So it was obvious that uh, since nobody in the World Skating Federation wanted to do any harm to the competitors, uh, we did not even invite any member. On the contrary, I must say there, was a couple, there were a couple of members who said we will join and I personally told them be careful, don't do that, because in the moment it would be extremely dangerous. And then, you see, uh, after, after this, let's say, nobody became a member and uh, really uh, it was the end, the end of the story. There have been several mistakes made um, in, uh, in good faith, I mean, there were some promises made by members that they would uh, join uh, immediately, by the strong members who would join immediately. But uh, mm, the announcement was made a little bit too in, too in a rush as the, the new judging system. Probably had uh, we waited a little more and have some more work done and some uh, other persons involved, probably it would have been different. But uh, it was uh, felt that uh, the announcement in Washington was uh, one of the best uh, ways to announce the World Skating Federation. And uh, some of the persons that had uh, absolutely promised that they would uh, join the World Skating Federation uh, when they saw the reaction of the ISU, they withdrew, and therefore, you see, it, 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 it ended, it, it never came to light, I must say.
No, this I cannot. I cannot do it because uh, it would be. They would be penalized even now. So I don't want to do any harm to these federations, but they are big federations. But um, mm, you see, the the only possibility really to create a new federation is if uh, the big members, which are four or five in the world, say we want to split. Then they found a new federation with their skaters and with their money, because the television goes where the skaters are. So if the strong members join with their skaters and the television, the other members will follow. You know, the ISU has, I don't know, 40, 45, 46 members. Most of them survive thanks to the contribution that the ISU is giving annually so far. Now, if they will reduce the contribution, all the members will have problems. So it is obvious that the, the small members can only stay where the money is and in the moment it is the ISU. And it will never be the small members who can separate because uh, what, what can they do? I mean, uh, they, they have no money, they have no skaters. So the only possibility is that uh, the strong members get together and do something. The problem is that probably uh, if uh, a rumor <laughs> circulates that this is a project, well, the ISU will take some steps even against the strong members, so I don't know. First of all, you see, there are just a clarification, there have never been WSF members because for the WSF a member can only be a skating federation. So this person that were involved, as myself and the, all the others that you know, have only been, uh, uh, let's say, cooperating, working uh, on the preparation of this uh, constitution, more or less, and trying to create this possible World Skating Federation. I think it is absolutely unfair that the ISU has taken this uh, decision to take away the eligibility from uh, those persons who only contributed, let's say, to something which was killed before being born. Because really, this World Skating Federation, apart some noise made when it was uh, announced, it didn't do any kind of a harm at all at, to the ISU. Uh, Didier Gayage and Marie-Ren Legun destroyed completely the credibility of the sport. And the sport has been suffering immensely after this scandal. We know that the fans and the public and the people think that it, it is all corrupted, which is not true, but this is the image that they have given through this big scandal. And there have been even threatens to throw out the fig figure skating from the Olympics because of this scandal. So, I mean, they have been suspended for three years. Marilene Legun is back again. She is not uh, judging for her own uh, decision, but she could be judging except at the Olympic Games because she's banned from the Olympic Games, but she could be judging the world, so the Europeans if she wants. And Didier Gayage is still around, happier than ever, and he could be re-elected president as he was elected president of the French Federation, and he might maybe have a role again in the ISU in the future, we don't know. So compared to what uh, uh, Sally Stapleford or Britta Lindgren or Judith or Ron and John and Jane Garden did, I mean, it is so uh, small what they have done. But they have been deprived, till the moment, there are still appeals going on, of their eligibility. And this is for life. 
even if uh, Mr. Cinquanta says that uh, one can always uh, ask the ISU to be reinstated. But this is a joke. I mean, can you imagine you are Sally Stapleford or Britta Lindgren who are suspended now, taking away the eligibility, they apply to the ISU to be reinstated and the ISU will say yes. I mean, <laughs> they can tell this to anybody, but not to the figure skating people. So, in, in, um, in fact, they would be deprived by, of their rights to, to work in skating, to, to be judges or whatever, forever, and compared to what the other two have done. I mean, it is so, such a nonsense, such an injustice. And probably, as you said, it is a kind of a example. You see, if you do this, this is what will happen to you. And this is a, something that the people know, the people have seen, because we have seen also that all those who came forward uh, to help the ISU to solve the horrible case after Salt Lake City. They have all been thrown away. All. Sally, Rita, Hisanaga, uh, who else? And all the judges who came forward have been penalized with the severe sanctions because they did not behave well according to the ISU. So you see, uh, this surely is a message, and this is such a wrong message to me, because it would, uh, uh, it really prevents any kind of uh, um, dissent. So if you dissent uh, from the ISU, you are out. And this is one of the reasons also why um, the majority of the judges are afraid to talk the majority of the coaches are afraid to talk because they say that this could maybe damage their skaters and so on. So it is not a good atmosphere, in my opinion, the one that has been created in the ICU. I think that all the examples that we had from the past, uh, starting from uh, Hermann Schichtel in the time when they proposed to introduce the new constitution uh, with me that ha has been, let's say, not thrown out but made a, um, created a position for which I could not be re-elected because I was, in, I dared to disagree, I openly disagreed with the way the ISU was conducted. Then we had the cases, as I told you, of all those who spoke up against uh, the decisions of the ISU uh, and uh, in uh, thinking to do the well of the sport, the good of the sport, and they've been penalized. So, I mean, the whole, what we have seen, all the examples we have seen so far, Jean Semft, for instance, another good example, Jean Semft came forward to disclose a corruption, a trial of corruption uh, in the last Olympic Games, and which was the result that she came forward and she was suspended for six months. And then I would like to quote to you how different it was in the past. Uh, we had uh, a case when uh, Mr. Rod Kappel was suspended and uh, an American judge. Elaine de Moore, the wife of Chuck de Moore, who was a council member, she wrote to me saying that Rod Couple had approached her and had tried to influence her in her judging. This had happened during a competition in Prague. She wrote to me this a few months later. We suspended Rod Couple for 10 years. And uh, after that, Jacques Favard wrote to Hélène de Moore a personal letter written by hand thanking her for having informed us about the couple to whom we gave a 10-year suspension, hoping that this will be an example. So you see, Jacques Favard thanked the judge 
for having told us about this fact. Then in 91, Ron Fenning was judging for the first time in the World Championships. And he also lived through these sad stories. And he wrote to me, I was a council member then, and uh, he told that he had witnessed cases of pressures of the same kind by Irina Psalyamova and uh, Chia Bordogna from Italy. Well, these two judges have been suspended for three years and we in the council decided that Joseph Didich should write a letter to Ron Fenning thanking him for being honest and informing us of these sad cases. So you see, in those years, it was just the opposite. Now, if you come up, you are suspended or you receive a warning letter. In the years before, we thanked the judges who had the courage to come forward and say these awful things. So this is the difference. Well, we have to divide two things. Ottavio Cinquanta has had the great merit, if you want to say, to make excellent contracts for the ISU, especially after the famous case of uh, Tania Harding and uh, Nancy Kerrigan, which of course made our sport the most popular in the world for a sad story, if you want, but became very popular. So he was very clever and very good in business. Um, his problem, in my opinion, is that he, who is a speed skater, who for his own admission, he's not an expert in figure skating, he in any case wanted to interfere in a very, very heavy way in running of our sport. And this, uh, not only with the new judging system, even before uh, when uh, they tried to, to cover the cheating, to put all the dirty under the rug, and uh, to change, when they changed in the council the sanctions so that now there are no more sanctions at all. And uh, so I, I think that all these uh, I would say only political way of running or running figure skating is very bad for our sport. And uh, in my opinion, um, many of the decisions taken during the Ottavio Cinquanta reign have been uh, not good for figure skating. And we see now the results. I mean, it is really concerning in the United States and Canada, we have seen now the Grand Prix series without public, without skaters more or less, and uh, um, the fans are not, got, not going any longer to see the competitions. They are not interested any longer in the sport in television. So there must be a reason behind all that. There are many reasons together, let me say, maybe even economical reasons if you want, but the ISU should start thinking if there isn't something in the way they conduct the sport that is damaging it. Well, for me, the quality of skating improved uh, dramatically immediately afterwards. Because, uh, you know, the compulsory figures imposed hours and hours of training every day. It cost a lot of money because you had to buy the eyes, of course, you had to take lessons. And they reduced the time the skaters had to do their programs, to study choreography, to prepare to dancing. Now they all do some dancing, some ballet, I mean, all men. So, this, in my opinion, improved the quality of the skating. Besides the fact that it helped the best talent to come up, you see, 
And this, of course, was a great help for the sport. Uh, I don't want to mention any skater competing now, but we had really fantastic skaters who came up, like Kurt Browning or uh, Yagudin or some other skaters that I don't remember now, but uh, who probably would have never uh, won a world championship or an Olympic game with the compulsory figures because they they were not, uh, not, I mean, not able to do them, but not good enough to get uh, good placing. So for me, uh, the elimination of compulsory figures first uh, improved the skating, second allowed the really talented skaters to win. And this, of course, is a big help also for the promotion of the sport, because before, sometimes, the people could not understand why some excellent skaters, like we had uh, Janet Lynn uh, or uh, who else? Uh, uh, we had some other skaters who were penalized. Uh, Tora Creston. Creston one, and um, Jacqueline Dubiev in the past past time. But there were really some excellent skaters who could never make a good result because of the compulsory figures. And that was a shame, and a shame that the public could not understand because the figures were something secret, you know, going on without the public. Nobody could really see what happened on the ice. Nobody, you know, they could only trust the marks of the judges, but the, the idea that maybe something wrong happened there as well was uh, quite uh, common. So, uh, but especially it was necessary from the moment that television started to be interested in figure skating. You know, when I was at first in the ISU, uh, television did not exist. The first contract with television was made by with Dick Button many, many years ago, but at the beginning there was no television at all. So the only people that could see the sport were the spectators in the arena. And uh, afterwards, when the television came in, and we felt the need, you know, to make the sport uh, appealing to television. So it is not true that uh, when I decided to uh, fight for the lesion of figures, it was because of television, as somebody says. It was not because of television, but it was because I felt that if we didn't do that, the sport would die. And uh, I still think that it was a great... Uh, a great fact, an important step, and um, somebody says now um, the skaters have difficulty in doing the steps because they don't have the figures. First of all, I don't think it is true, but second, it all depends on how you plan the trainings, because uh, uh, you should still learn to do the trees, the brackets and the rockers without the need of having perfect edges. You see? Unless now with the new judging system they will invent that they have to go and see if the rockers were clean on the ice maybe, to get a level five, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs>
it was really um, ridiculous. Sometimes, as I mentioned also in my book, for instance, Katarina Witt, with her block judging, she was really overmarked in compulsory figures, which was wrong for the other skaters. As I always say, it was good for the sport because uh, at least she won the championships, she won the Olympic Games, and she was a marvelous skater and she was going, doing well for the sport. But it was absolutely unfair, I mean, uh, uh, to the other skaters who maybe could have won uh, if she had not been uh, given gifts <laughs> by the judges in figures. So surely, f f I think figure skating has been bad, badly judged when there were the figures. Yes, because really, you know, they were, no doubt, the greatest skaters in those years. Uh, Tolan Creston was a, a fantastic talent and he brought uh, a new way of skating, a new way of uh, showing, uh, uh, you know, the personality and so on. Janet Lean had a marvelous way of skating. But with their figures were really, really poor, in spite of what uh, maybe Tolan thinks. And with those, uh, the, the weight that the figures had on the final result, Toller could never become the world champion, and the same of Janet Lynn. So it was, uh, they were really penalized for having been skating in a wrong time. I was involved in that story. You know, at, at, in those years we had very, very strict rules for which uh, a skater who got a little money or made an, um, had a sponsor or something, was immediately uh, ineligible. And uh, then, with one of my first fights in the council, was to change this rule and to allow the skaters to um, make contracts, have sponsors, be paid for exhibitions, participate in these pro-am competitions so that they could make some money because, I mean, all sports we know are like this. All sports are extremely expensive, so we were really old-fashioned in there. So when we changed these rules, it made that some skaters had been, let's say, penalized, like Brian Boitano, for instance, who had turned professionals with the old rules and now with the new rules, they would not be professionals. So we said uh, we have to allow them for once to be reinstated if they want, only once, so that they have the same chances, let's say, as the other skaters have now. So there was this little moratorium made for which, for the Olympic Games in, uh, uh, what was it, in 94? Uh, they could skate. And after that, of course, it was no more necessary because now they don't lose their eligibility if they teach skating or if they take part in an exhibition tour or so. So this was the reason why we thought it was fair to reinstate some of these competitors who had lost their eligibility because of these uh, old-fashioned rules, we can say. It's difficult to say in the present situation, you know, because I don't know how this uh, new judging system will uh, affect the sport in the next years. Um, I hope, my hope is that uh, something will be changed, drastically changed, after the Olympic Games. I know that for the moment, and this is correct in one way, uh, the ISU doesn't want to, to make any changes, even if some things they recognize that they are wrong. But they say we cannot change them now, we are too close to the Olympic Games, we already made a revolution, so we have to stick to that. But I hope that some of the, what I call the aberrations of the new system, 
will be, I hope, uh, eliminated or changed in the next few years. Because to me, if we leave things as they are, I don't see such a brilliant future for our sport. I mean, I, 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 I'm afraid it will lose its beauty, its freshness. It will lose the, the possibility to have this great talent come and bring a new era. We had in every uh, decade, let's say, some skaters who led the way for the next to come. They really changed the approach to the sport. But if you have all these restrictions, all these limits, all these strings, I don't think there will be anybody who will come up with new elements, with new lift, with new ideas, because they cannot do them. I mean, they are not foreseen in this uh, so strict program. So I hope that there will be a completely change in the approach of the free program to allow the, the skaters to express themselves as they want, as it was before. And this, for me, I think it was uh, it was so important, you know, uh, to 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 allow the big talents to express themselves. And this system, for me, doesn't allow that any longer. That's the other problem. Uh, if you look at the number of injuries there were last year till now, it is terrible because there has always been injuries, of course, because I mean, when you do a sport, it is possible. But we have had so many injuries, one after the other last year. In, uh, in Moscow last year, we had, as I say, the World Championship of the Survivors because they were all more or less uh, injured, all more or less uh, with problems, and now the same. Look at the number of injuries we have in pair skating, in, in the ladies, in the men, and uh, now in ice dancing. So I think that this is partly due to the requirements of the new system again. They, they have to try too much, they have to try uh, to include all possible difficulties and this and this maybe is the reason of the injuries. <laughs> uh, the competition in, in Calgary was uh, well, I, I well, very well remember that because in one way it was a little bit of a nightmare for me <laughs> because I was the referee of this event and uh, I liked both skaters very much. And um, before the competition, just before the competition started the, the, the afternoon, I saw that uh, Brian Osser had the entry of a spin in the short program with some steps before that were very attractive, but not really in conformity with the requirements for the regional pro for the short program. And I thought that uh, there could be a possibility that some judges would take, you know, the chance to, to apply the rules strictly and maybe to penalize Brian. So my instinct uh, was to go immediately to Brian or to Brian's coach and tell him, listen, this is wrong. But since I knew what kind of a pressure there was on this poor boy, because being in Canada, can you imagine, as a Canadian, uh, the whole press, the whole country was on him waiting for his gold medal. So in the afternoon I was in the hotel, I was thinking, what should I do? If I don't say anything, it is unfair. And finally I said, you know, the boy could lose the Olympics for something which is not his fault. It is his coach's fault, who should read the rules, which is not often done by the coaches. So I pick up the phone and I call the village, I, the Canadian uh, delegation, and uh, I spoke with the team leader 
and they said, listen, this is what I saw. In my opinion, this uh, entry to this uh, required spin is not allowed. So you, it's up to you what you want to do. <laughs> and uh, I don't think they were very happy <laughs> about the fact that I told them, but I, I really felt it was my duty. And the next day, when I saw the short program in competition, the entry of the spin was changed and it was okay. So I was very happy because I said, okay, then uh, uh, I did the right thing. And uh, in that competition, I must say that, uh, again, the figures played uh, their role because Brian Voitano was definitely overmarked in the compulsory figures there. Uh, in my mark, he was not first, and uh, in the marks of Ben Wright, who was my assistant, he was even lower, I think. So if Boitano had been uh, properly judged in compulsory figures, probably Brian also would have been the Olympic champion. And, uh, but you see the figures played the, their game again. And uh, then after the free skating, uh, in my heart I must say that Boitano definitely deserved the title because he skated absolutely the best program of his life with the best choreography of his life because uh, Boitano had a, a kind of way of skating as everybody has and that program suited him very much for his way of skating so he was absolutely perfect while Brian also although, although he skated well you could see that he was in tension you see he was not just uh, leaving his program as he used probably because of the pressure so, on the whole, I think that uh, the result was okay. And uh, what I did, uh, I think, was again to help the skater. So I feel that it, it was not, uh, it was correct. Well, you see, it is easy to say, uh, you should tell a skater that uh, a mistake is not uh, a tragedy, which is true. The rule even say that you can even fall and win, it used to say, I don't know now. <laughs> but uh, it is obvious that the skater who commits such a mistake in an in a important competition like that, Afterwards, it is almost impossible that he cancels this problem and uh, he becomes a little more intentional. I think this is absolutely normal. I mean, it's uh, and it depends also very much from the temperament of the skater. Not all the skaters are the same. So, some skaters are able to do that. Okay, this is finished, I don't think of it anymore. Other skaters. Uh, are just the opposite. If they miss the first jump, then the, the rest of the program is uh, compromised because uh, of their probably fear, their tension. But uh, Robin is right. Uh, one mistake is not uh, determining for a program, but it's easy to say from outside. <laughs> <laughs> it is a curious statement because <laughs> there is a big difference between that. I don't know if he, if uh, Vedenin wanted to say that he was proud to have put uh, Boitano first, uh, maybe ignoring some pressure that he could have had from his federation. Uh, you know, Vedenin uh, has always been a very clever person and he was uh, a good judge. And uh, so I don't know what he wants, which message he wants to, to send you, saying that he was proud to have put Boitano first. I don't know if he had some other orders, maybe. Uh, 
Uh, for me too, he was clearly better. He was clearly better for one tenth of a point, but in that time, and in, in one tenth of a point was uh, quite important. Now I don't remember who were the judges who placed the Boitano first and the also second. For me, he's right. In free skating, Boitano uh, had to be first. Because of her temperament, she was fantastic. Uh, in the moment she went uh, on the ice to compete, uh, you know, she she uh, she exploded. I don't know. Uh, I think she she had the right temperament for the competition. There are some skaters who are good uh, during the trainings, and then as soon as they see the public, they die. Uh, she needed the public, she needed the, the audience, she needed to, to show herself, you know. And she was, of course, uh, beautiful, she is beautiful, but she was very beautiful. And she was a, a great uh, actress. Um, she, um, her temperament, I think, made her win. And because she was she was good in jumps, okay, but that was not her best part. The best part was really the way she was able to interpret the music. When she did Carmen, she was Carmen. And that, that was her great ability, you see. She was a really a champion. And for me, when I say uh, she was a champion, is also because I never consider a great champion a skater who comes once, wins and goes. Uh, you become a great champion if you can be a champion for several years. I mean, you, you show that it was not a chance that you won that title one day. And Katarina did that. She won uh, many Europeans, many worlds, uh, two Olympics. So she was a real champion. But of course, uh, again, she was very much helped in the compulsory figures. That, that's it, that's for sure. Hmm. Oh, it's difficult. <laughs> I would say to allow more democracy. To allow more democracy to listen to the people, to allow people to speak up, which has been clearly said and clearly forbidden. He openly said that, uh, you know, either you like the system or you're out. Either you approve all what is done by the ISU 10% or you're out. So you see, this for me, is not the right way to conduct an international federation. There must be democracy, there must be a public discussion, the people must be free to express opinions, there must be dissent allowed. Because for me, dissent is the basis of democracy. Without dissent, you have only the dictatorship. I'm sorry to say that, but it has been so always in the world, in every country, and in sport.